This time on Graveyard Cars, Mark paints the burnt orange Hemi Charger, AMD delivers the Phantom Cuda, and the ghouls rush to complete the daily's 1970 383 Cuda. Coming up on this episode of Graveyard Cars. In case you missed it, our 1970 Hemi Charger is blocked and ready for paint. The Phantom Cuda was sent back to Auto Metal Direct to have new metal installed. My daughter and Will are back to Team Graveyard. The 383 is installed in Mark and Elena's 1970 Cuda. I assigned Alyssa the task of hiring us a new body man. And our new progress board has been updated and will keep us on task. Well, it's an exciting day for me. Uh, this is our FK5 Burn Orange 70 Hemi Charger, right? Uh, as anybody that's ever known me, the show, read anything about me, my favorite color of all time was burn orange. So when I made the deal with the guy who owns this, I said, I will paint the car personally, because number one, I've never sprayed FK5 since I was a kid doing touch-ups on my own car. And two is, I needed it to be perfect. I told him I would make it perfect, and so I have dedicated every spare minute and some non-spare minutes over the last 12 months getting this body ready to paint. The 70 Hemi Charger is the first car that's gonna be painted in our new AFC paint booth. Uh, our old booth was fine, but it was old. It was about 30 years old. It was 15 years old when I got it. Uh, but we still managed to put out some beautiful work. You've seen it. The new booth, state-of-the-art, side-down draft, built-in mixing room next to it, and I'm excited to see the finished product. So what's the CFM when this thing's all locked up? This booth moves 18,000 CFM. That's 18,000 cubic wow. feet of gas. Yes. This is our mixing room. So I'm talking about eight by 16, eight by 20, what is it? Eight by 16. So you know our other one was five by nine? Right. Yeah, yeah, you had to go outside to change your mind. I mean, that <laughs> thing was that thing was small. Yeah, you have to have ample room to. You know, when I'm in there and I'm doing my thing, and I know you've seen the show, so you know. You got room to dance now. You got a little room to do my dancing. Like if I'm mixing up EV2, FC7, FM3, you know what I'm talking about, I can do this all day long. What paint code do you want? Give me a color. <laughs> Give me a color, I'll give you the code. La la, la subline. Subline, FJ5, you want the darker version, FJ6, acid grass green, or go green in the Dodge? Okay, how about Plum Crazy? Plum Crazy, FC7, DBC mix number, DBC 2210. Nice. If there's anything else you want to know about Mopars and paint, you just ask the kid. That's how I roll. I'm very humbled by the equipment that we now have. The shop is beautiful. The paint booth, best one on the market. And so when I look around here and I see that these are the fruits of our labor, I am proud of it, but I'm also humbled. A million seventy-five. Yeah. BTU. Talking 180 degrees on a cold day. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're scaring me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You want some pork? You want some bubber boy? <laughs> Throw you so many combinations, you feel like a lock. <laughs> it's time to spray some FK5 Deep Burn Orange, my favorite color. Our folks back east at uh, AMD Installation are putting together our 1971 Phantom Cuda. The 71 Phantom Cuda is an exceptionally rare and desirable car. 71 Cuda is the pinnacle of all the muscle car years. This particular one happens to be a V-code, 385 horsepower. The 108 of them made with a four speed. This one happens to have a shaker hood and is in tour red. Yeah, when Mark got the Phantom Cuda and told me he was gonna document the restoration of it, then he had the uh, idea of starting a television show with the four of us. I said, if anybody could do it, he could. On July 5th, 1981, a guy was driving it. He was in a race with a buddy of his. Got out of control at a high rate of speed, crashed into the wall, bounced off that wall, hit another wall, ended up in the middle of the road. The right quarter was destroyed, left quarter was destroyed, both front frame rails were destroyed. So back in the day, we referred to that as totaled. 
people scoffed at it, said there's no way you can repair the car, it would be a rebody. When I heard that people were saying that we were gonna rebody the car, that's what inspired Graveyard Cars. I thought to myself, I wanna document it. Every step of the process, I want it to be forever immortalized on film. As irony would have it, Mike Greg came out a couple of years ago and uh, we ended up talking about the Phantom Cuda. And as we were talking about it, we agreed one thing. It's certainly, my, my hunch is right. It's just a wreck car that needs to be repaired. He made the offer. Look, if you ever get too far behind and you need some help, we got the AMD installation center. Let me know. I packaged the car up, which was a matter of putting it on a pallet and shrink wrapping it, loaded it onto a cargo truck and shipped it back to Georgia. The guys back there dropped everything that they were doing at the time it showed up so they could immediately get it in and begin the restoration process on it. I know Mark would like to take all the credit for restoring the car, and he'll probably try, but everybody that's had a hand in the car has the same quality ethics, the same restoration ethics, same dedication as we do here at GYC. The truth of the matter is we're busier than we've ever been. I only have a short period of time on this earth to get these cars done. If I can take somebody up on an offer as generous as that, I'm going to do it. It's going to allow us to move straight into body and paint as soon as it gets back in final assembly. So what's happening with the car is the same as if a collision shop was doing a car back then. They replaced the crumpled sheet metals with straight sheet metal, bodywork, paint, just like being repaired. You know, I have an obligation at the end of the day to the owner of the vehicle to make sure it's done right. So uh, with today's technology, I have the ability to virtually be in the shop with the guys and look over the repairs and the welds and the replacement. So when we got the car, it was a wadded up shell. When it left here, it had been stripped. From what I hear, it sounds like it's coming together. I'm really anxious to see it when it comes back. While things are moving smoothly, we still have deadlines here. Our 1970 CUDA 383 automatic FE5 Rally Red goes away in one week from now. The 340 automatic EV2 Tour Red CUDA goes away two weeks after that. To do these things, I just hired what I believe to be as a prodigy. After talking to him, meeting with him, I believe he is going to be the answer to our prayers. Hi, Alyssa. Hey! This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. So on this car, this is our 1973 40 Cuda. So this is a 340 automatic, it's a factory rear window louver car. It's a really neat car, it's a factory hockey stick stripe car. It's EV2 Tor Red. So far, we've completely stripped the body, completely disassembled the body, replaced nearly every panel on it. I'm talking about quarter panels, inner and outer wheelhouses, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, rear body panel, we're talking about center trunk floor, rear seat, under seat pans, both step wells, front aprons, and core support. Although we were able to save the original numbers in the upper tie bar because it was still in good shape. After that, we went through, we completely restored the rear end and it's installed and it's all out to spec for an eight and three quarter with a 323 sure grip on it. New drive shaft, had that made for the car only because this car isn't 100% numbers matching and I'd rather put a new one in than an old crusty rusty one, so that's got a new one in it. Motor and transmission, the 340 and the 727, which is correct behind the 340, not a 904, like a lot of people think, has been completely rebuilt. Amco did that for us last year. The engine has been completely rebuilt. All the suspension came member, upper and lower radiator hoses. Everything that goes on these cars is brand new, and this car is ready to start. The other car that we're working on today is Mark and Elena's 1970 Cuda 383 automatic. It came out here, we disassembled it, had the body dipped, brought it back, and since then we put quarters, outer wheelhouses, trunk floor and trunk floor extensions in it, and one floor pan, the driver's side floor pan. The rest of it was in really good shape. Then we did the body and the paint and the assembly. The assembly included rebuilding the original eight and three quarter rear end with a 323 sure grip and a 489 case. The automatic transmission is a 727 torque flight. The owner had his friend build that transmission and the engine, which is a really healthy 383 that if you recall back to a season or so ago, you saw us started up on the engine run stand. So we know it did run, now we just have to have all the plumbing right on it so it'll run today, which is your spark plug wires, carburetor, ignition, things like that. The rest of it's all built out. You'll notice a lot of things on this car that are not OEM. We've talked about that before. We know that when you look around the shop and you see the cars, every one of them is OEM. This one we straight on, uh, and I primarily did that because 
you know, the owner's always right. And as we started working on the car, he started talking about the things that he remembered seeing on cars that he had wanted from the time he was a kid. And I felt like, you know what? It's not a numbers matching. It doesn't have the original engine in it. Who cares? Everything else under the hood, as far as like the exhaust manifolds, that's original stuff. Power brake, booster, master cylinder, that's original. We should wash your reservoir, the things that go on around it, all the peripheral things, uh, even right down to the radiators, the correct 22 inch, which is correct for the 383, where a 440 would have had, in 71 it could have had a 22 inch, or in 70 it could have had a 22 inch if you didn't have air conditioning. Uh, if you had air conditioning, you would have got the 2998 956, which would have gave you the 26 inch radiator. So this is the correct radiator, even though it's an aftermarket replica of the original. So right now, they're filling up the rest of the fluids on the 340 CUDA. I'm getting ready to go over a couple of little last minute things on the 70 CUDA 383 car. And in a few minutes, we're hoping we're gonna smell some exhaust fumes. Hi, Alyssa. Hey, how are you? Hey, nice to meet you, David nice Ray. Nice you too. So I hear you are coming from a long ways. Yeah, from Montana. Uh, I was a truck driver and uh, put in the application through Facebook, probably pretty close to early December. I've been, you know, working on Mopars my whole life. I, I know them inside and out and, you know, really uh, have a passion for the cars and have a passion for the way Mark restores them, which is, you know, to OEM, you know, original, just like the way they came off showroom four. So I, I personally think the headshot that you brought in, I actually have it right here, is kind of one of the major reasons you got Hired, I think. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> I think he was looking for someone that looked just like him. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> oh my gosh. He works on the cars as a hobby, and it wasn't the his day-to-day -day how he made his money. So I think we really need somebody on our team that feels the same way about the cars as my dad does. It's really good to meet you, officially. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Yeah, and I'm going to yeah. try to be out in the shop because I want to pick up on some stuff. It was nice to meet Alyssa. You know, I didn't know, you know, at first she was Mark's daughter, but, you know, after finding out, it made it even more cool, you know, so it was kind of neat to see her involved. Uh, sure, I'll see you around. All right, thanks for your time. Bye. Bye-bye. So how are we starting this without the wiring, boss? We're just gonna use a remote starter on it. The reason we have to hot wire the car, so to speak, is there's no proper ignition in it. So we're just gonna run a wire over to the ballast resistor from the hot side of the battery. That'll give us power to the coil. That's hot wiring a car. Well, the reason I've got Will alongside me uh, doing the engine work and, and assembling, doing some of the final assembly on these cars is he comes from a painting background. I do appreciate the time that he takes because like you said, everything I've always done has been strictly paint. No, I just think it makes me kind of more well-rounded because I, I don't know any of this. Well-rounded circle, planet, system. Right there. If it's advanced too far, it starts kicking back. I can usually set them right on the money by ear. You didn't want, oh. Yeah, I'm no, sure that's, that's right there. Okay. You're gonna need a little more fuel. While I was bringing the fuel around to put into the CUDA because it wouldn't start, I happen to notice that the sending unit was sitting over there on the bench, not installed in the tank, which is a great reason why it wouldn't run. What you were looking for it, you left it. <laughs> I didn't leave it out. I didn't put the tank in. Mm, no, no. <laughs> we're going down. So. No. Working with Dave now uh, has been a joy. He knows what he's doing. He follows instructions. He's got a great attitude. And it seems to me that he's a real good diagnostician. This guy actually takes his time and diagnoses it. He's kind of a mini me, if you will which the world needs more of, I would say. Well, this is the part we're missing on the fuel tank. Fuel sending unit, pickup unit. Uh, this deal right here, this float, operates your fuel gauge. And this is where the fuel draws from. So this is what we're missing. This is why we're not getting any fuel up to our fuel pump. Let's start this mother humper. That not sound good. In most cases, the second digit in a vehicle identification number on a Mopar represents the price class. On a 1969 Charger 500 and Daytona, the second digit is an X. What does the X officially stand for? High, experimental, Fast Top. The answer coming up after the break. What does the X on a 69 Charger 500 or Daytona Charger officially stand for? 
The answer is fast top. It has been referred to as experimental, but despite the fact that the second digit in most cases represents the price class, L for low, M for medium, H for high, it actually reflects the roof style, even though the third and fourth digit represent the sport roof as well. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. That not sound good. Well, what's going on is we had uh, two problems with our 340. We actually had three problems. When we initially fired it off, it was running on about six cylinders. So we did a quick compression test to find out it had low compression on it. And it, what had happened is I built the engine like a year ago and it had been sitting around. So I thought that the rings maybe had frozen onto the piston, maybe not swollen out where they're supposed to be originally. We took it out back and we ran it until it got up to regular temperature. What the f is this happen? You know? It actually overheated, which is probably good because it raised everything up to where it needed to be. And that let go of the ring, so we got our compression back. So that was one problem down. But now we've got an intake leak, a uh, vacuum leak, so it didn't want to idle under 2,000 RPM. And we've got a tappet that's making noise or some kind of metallic noise that sounds like a tappet. So that's why we had to take the intake and the rockers back off again. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and take the rocker arm assembly off of there, push rods, so let's get everything over to the solvent tank, wash it down, and take a look at it. Yep, okay. get a good look at all the rockers. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna clean these rockers up to see if I can find out if there's a plugged up oil galley, any cracks, you know, something that might cause us to lose pressure up there to make these clatter. Huh. We have a slightly bent push rod, folks. So there's one bent push rod. I'm gonna order new push rods, lifters, and rockers. And at least you, that way you've done it all. And then look at the intake. Yeah. This came with so the you've kit. You've had a leak, right? I well, mean, look obviously. At it. Yeah. First of all, I've never seen a small block that used this metal. I don't know if I'm just full of shit or not remembering right, but look at that metal. It's not even crushed. Uh -uh. It's crushed here. It's crushed down here. It's crushed on this, but look at these up here. Yeah. It wasn't even seating. Uh-uh. So, so we replace the intake gasket when we go back together, obviously, and that should cure our problem. We yeah. have. What is it? Cuda's here. Too good. What's that? Nice. The Cuda is back, and there's gonna be a party. Hey nah, hey nah. I call this the reverse rooster. Well, this is it. I mean, this is such a historic, this is a historic moment. Historic. This is our 71 Phantom Cuda. So with the agreement in place between AMD, AMD Installation Center and myself, I packaged the car up, which was a matter of putting it on a pallet and shrink wrapping it, loaded it onto a cargo truck and shipped it back to Georgia. The guys back there dropped everything that they were doing at the time it showed up so they could immediately get it in and begin the restoration process on it, moving it right to the head of the class. The truth of the matter is we're busier than we've ever been. I only have a short period of time on this earth to get these cars done. I want to get as many as humanly possible. If I can take somebody up on an offer as generous as that, I'm going to do it. It's going to allow us to move straight into body and paint as soon as it gets back in final assembly. So that's one more car instead of stopping all these other cars in their mid-process and putting that one ahead of it. So it's a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for AMD. It's a win-win for graveyard cars and for the world that wants to keep cherishing these cars for the next 100 years. This grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. So right now what we're doing is the guys are uh, going back together with the top end on the 340. When we tore it apart, we really didn't find too much that was definitive other than the intake gasket wasn't completely smashed and sealed. So I think that our intake was our, uh, was our leak. So while we had it apart to do the intake, I just decided that would be a good time to go ahead and put in the uh, brand new set of lifters and brand new set of push rods on it. 
So that's all going back together. They're just buttoning it up the top end. So we should be able to fire it up here in about 10, 15 minutes. Hopefully the clattering noise is gone and the vacuum leak is gone. So all the guys got to put on right now is hook up the fuel line, the PCB hose. Oh yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, route the plug wires, which he's almost done with now. And I just topped off the power steering. So we're ready to run here in a few minutes. We're gonna put uh, Bob's car outside and uh, try to get it running, you know, and hopefully all the work that we did on it is gonna solve our, our issue with the motor problem because we gotta get this car out of here so we can get started on Mark and Elena's. That's the way it's supposed to run. Help me up just a hair more timing. Up oh, ahead? Yep. Yep. Right now, we're just letting it break in. It sounds like it's running a whole lot better. It sounds like we might have got rid of our vacuum leak, so we're just kind of running up to operating temperature, about 2,000 RPM. And uh, as soon as it's all warmed up and broke in, we can set the idle down, set the timing, set the air fuel. Hopefully, the lifters get a little quieter. Mopars aren't the greatest oiling engines in the world. Sometimes they take longer than others. Come on, baby. So everything really, for the most part now, is starting to dial back in. I don't know if it was a lifter or a push rod or a combination of both of them that were making all the noise that has quieted down quite a bit. Definitely is running better. We still got to get it up to operating temperature. Uh, he's checking the water on it right now. We may need to add some to that. Uh, if we can get it to run and idle and do all the things it's supposed to do, we can set the timing on it. And uh, hopefully after that, we're ready to pull it back inside and start putting it together. Thing is, real. Royal wanted to just, you know, tear the whole thing apart. He, he, wanted, he said, oh, well, let's take it apart. And the, the rings are probably in backwards or something, you know? It's like me and Dave, I was telling Dave, you know, it's, I don't think so. You know, I, I put the motor together myself. Dave, is that right? That's right. So Royal, Royal's a parts replacer. He goes bananas. Something doesn't work out. He just wants to start throwing parts. Let's rip it around. We can have that engine out in an hour. We'll take the rings off. And no, let's just get it hot, and, and it'll let go of those rings. I was telling him. You know, Dave and me were in complete agreement. Right, Dave? That's right. We are in complete agreement on uh, the fact that it didn't need to come apart. But Royal being a parts, he's just crazy. He loves putting parts on an engine. So I don't mean it disrespectful, but, you know. Now that we got the 7340 running the way it's supposed to be, it sounds terrific. That's a weight off my shoulders. We got to jump back on the 7383 Cuda because that car with all of its aftermarket parts could just potentially be plagued with problems. So what's the difference on this one? <laughs> the difference is this one's going to start. <laughs> First time? <sighs> well, we've already had it on the engine run stand. It's just that the guy wanted all these crazy wires, the eight millimeter wires, and he wanted electronic ignition because it's not OE. I, the whole thing's been a pain in the ass because of that. Dave is doing a fantastic job on the car. Uh, he, like I said before, he's a great diagnostician. He's a problem solver. So with all this aftermarket stuff, instead of just throwing his hands up saying it doesn't work, he's solving the problems. Glad to have him doing it because honestly, that's the kind of stuff that frustrates me. I'm glad I don't have to be doing it. Mark and Atlanta's car had some challenges. Uh, anytime you deal with aftermarket parts, uh, you're gonna run into challenges. I mean, when you're working on a car that, that nice, just starting in and saying, here, go to it, you know, get all the glass lined and just start putting parts on the car. Uh, yeah, the nerves start going. We had to go with that custom uh, two-groove pulley right. on the top because that power. But you ran the original so 070 fan, right? Yep, 070 fan with uh, fan clutch. The fan clutch is yep. what I mean. And uh, yeah, and Are you use an original throttle bracket. So no. yeah, throttle bracket is an original bracket modified, of course, for that little Brock intake. Uh, everything had to be changed uh, and tweaked just a little bit to make make everything you work. Built but do you feel pretty good about the? Conversion kit. Feel pretty good about okay. the conversion kit. It's a uh, it's a standard conversion kit from going to points to electronic ignition. Okay. So we're just yeah yeah just hope that it actually yeah hope and you're plugged it, in. Yep, yeah, plugged in there and it plugs in all the original uh, clips and everything and then you run the one lead to the coil and God let's just hope it does something. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna this one's actually got some fuel in it. Yeah, how old the fuel is I don't know. So let's try it. Oh, that, give me some advance on that. 
Oh, we're going this way, right? Yes, sir. Right there. Okay. Go get there. <laughs> you know what that is? What you see? Yeah, I know exactly what that is. What? As soon as he lets off the key, the starter bypass circuit goes to. Does it? Mm -hmm. Yep. We got we got an aftermarket steering column uh, in this. It's actually a GM steering column. I know uh, it's not uh, original OE Mopar, and it's got a, a custom steering column. And what Mark is explaining is whenever it's in the start position, meaning the motor's cranking, you're getting ignition. And so it'll actually fire the motor. But as soon as you let off the, the start position to have it in the run position, we're losing circuit. So it's something in that steering column. We noticed the lock mechanism was messed up on the ignition and the, the ignition just feels funny. And so there's obviously more things wrong. We probably want to go through this though. So is it this one here? Well, that's electronic. I don't know if it, eh, it must yeah, be. Yeah, it should. It's still using a ballast resistor. I'm going to clip it on there, and you can snap yeah. that right over the top of it, I think. Here? Yeah, let's see if that'll work. It probably won't. It'll probably blow up or something. Ready? Yeah, try it. There it goes. Better get quieter. The engine sounds every bit as good as it did when it was on the engine run stand. That's fantastic. We need that. A little luck is a good thing to have. Um, now we can move on with the rest of the assembly of the car. <laughs> How'd that feel, boy? Once again, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, Dave is doing a great job. And not to take away from anybody, any predecessors, because everybody's worked hard over the years, but he is truly a prodigy. He knows what he's doing. He's on track. He's getting things done. Uh, right now, he's getting ready to move the car outside and run through the gears, top off the transmission, make sure everything's working like it's supposed to. While he's doing that, I'm going to go over with Mike and start building out the 1974 46 pack for the four-speed Plum Crazy FC7 Challenger RT. So I think you already did the differential on it, right? Yep, differential's full. But if you're looking for me, I'll be over in the machine shop because I'm gonna help Mike put together the 446 back engine for our purple car, which is the next one you're gonna be putting together as soon as you're done with the 340 Cuda. Perfect, <laughs> sounds good. Give, the bit. Give him a look. Yep. Give him. Very good. <laughs> All right. What we're getting ready to do right now is assemble the 440 six-pack engine for the 70 Challenger RT, which is a JS23. What's the fifth code for a 446 pack and 70? I can't remember. V like victory. V like victory. Oh, okay. that's right. Yeah. All we right. Talked about that. This is the numbers matching engine. How can you tell? Because it's the same as the, the last of the VIN number, right? And that is the original VIN number to our 70 Dodge Challenger RT 446 pack four-speed Dana track pack through four rear ends, FC7 black vinyl top. No stripe, stripe the B88 car, but it does have the RT badges, which is mandatory. And it also has a mandatory rally dash in it. Other than that, it doesn't have a whole lot of options. So. Now we're going to go ahead and get the car running and put it in gear and make sure the tires and everything are turning in forward and turning in reverse. like that. You don't usually come across the numbers matching engines like this. These cars were built for one thing. They were built to go fast. They were built to stomp to the floor, shift the gears, and beat Billy Bob up at the gut on Saturday night. So what are the odds that the car that was built for that is still going to have its original engine? Or is its original engine going to be busted and blown to pieces? So when you come across one, you start out with one, I think, 852 446-pack four-speed cars in 70, I believe. I'm not positive of that number. How many are left with their original numbers matching engines? The engine assembly went amazingly well. Uh, that's what happens when you have everything laid out and you know exactly what you're doing and you got good help next to you. So now with that done, I'm gonna go out back, check in on Dave, see how he's doing on the QC items for the 383 Cuda. It's riding better. I like that height. Yeah. I like that good. height a lot better. Yep. yep. It's a nice, should have a little more clearance on the front wheels. Once they get the alignment, that should be perfect. Yeah, brought the back up a little bit. It's it looks a lot right. better. Yeah. yeah. One of the best parts of my job is being able to road test these cars. I don't always get to do it. Uh, sometimes these cars, the minute we're done, especially in the past, we'd be done on the day that it's supposed to go away so I didn't get a chance to drive them. 
Uh, in this particular case, I do. So I'm excited to go do that. And of course, you know, when you're test driving a car, I think that one of the fundamental things that has to be done is squawking the tires, snorking them. What? Oh, crap. True or false? The vehicle identification number on a 1970 Plymouth Superbird did not distinguish it from its sister, the Plymouth Roadrunner. The answer coming up after the break. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So, true or false? The vehicle identification number on the Plymouth Superbird did not distinguish it from its sister, the Roadrunner. The answer is true. In 1970, the Plymouth Roadrunner, the standard Roadrunner, was not available with a 440, 375 horsepower Super Commando engine. It was only available in the Superbird. So if you look at the fifth digit and you have a U, that is what distinguishes it as a Superbird. No other specific character says it's a real NASCAR. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. What? Oh, crap. Sounds like the brakes. Well, I, I mean, the engine runs great. When I did my burnout, it looks like it might have... Uh, my initial thought is anything can happen. There's 450,000 moving parts inside of a car. So inside the brakes, it sounds like something may have come off. Maybe a keeper. Something's dragging but, in there, so... Yeah, it's just the rear brakes are... Something's, it sounds like something fell apart in there. So I'm just going to use a Stringo to move it back inside. We'll get it up in the air and see what it is. Well, for the most part, everything worked great on the car. It run, run drive and find we got a little noise in the in the back end. I think it's a brake part or something that came apart. So we're going to get the wheel off of it and uh, take a look at it. And that's what happens. And that's why we road test them is to find out problems, you know, before the customer has them. Dave has been doing a fantastic job. Uh, we're nearly out of the woods. Couple little uh, faux pas inside the brakes. We'll fix that. We'll be ready for tomorrow morning. That's it. Those pieces. Right. Yep. We'll do it. This is really cool. The guys came out from AMD to check in on the car to make sure we're happy. That's customer service. On top of everything, they flew 3,000 miles just to make sure that we're pleased with the finished product, and we are. It's absolutely amazing. It's beautiful. All right, Haas, what do you want to show me? If you have a Torx uh, wrench, we can take that striker out right there. Oh, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> oh, I don't believe that. So this thing actually covers the original footprint where the actual Just door Just put it back on there closed. and then the door will shut again. Okay, there's a little tight. And that should just go. Money. That's insane. When you get a glimpse into the installation center and the way that we assemble the car, we've designed proprietary tables, which is basically what the factory did. Has the master pinholes designed into it and then the pads for the datum height. Really, rebuilding a car like this is all about the control. So the fixture for us is our control device. Royal, do you know right. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you're a carpenter, right? Go tear a house down to its foundation. Reuse the original door jam. Put the whole house back together again and use the original screw holes for the hinges. Good luck with that. OK, for any car that's going to be a real car, it still has to have the VIN numbers in it. Absolutely. So you're just restoring the body. Yep. And you know where they're at. Oh, yeah. You are all things Mopar. Oh, yeah. That's our original cow. Look at that. This car right now, besides the fact that it looks great and is ready for body work, is exactly the way it was when it rolled off the assembly line before it went through body work. And its claim to fame is, of course, we needed to save some, some body numbers, right? Right. We had, a, we had a wadded up core support, but a portion of it was good. So we were able to save that. So the body numbers are still in the core support. You saved the cowl, which means we have all of that original stuff on there. I noticed that you put the entire left side rocker. You used both sides. Both side rockers. Your rockers. The rockers okay. from the car. OK. Salvage the rockers. I am 1 million percent happy with the job that AMD did. It's exactly the way we would have done it. Now, with those things in place and the body and its setting on a chassis, we can begin the final stages of this car's resurrection. Unburied dead are coming back to life. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So our little 70 Cuda is just about finished. We have all of the car complete except for the final detail stages. That's what Royal and I are getting ready to do now. That's the, the waxing, the detailing, getting compound out of the jams, wiping under the hood. We install all of the OEM decals back on it. 
After that, um, we're literally ready for uh, Mark and Elena to show up and pick up the car. What's kind of cool about today is, uh, with the old shop, we were just always seem to be panicking. Now, we're not panicking. We're done, we're out of the woods, we're doing a last minute detail. Boom, graveyard car's on to the next one. I close this trunk lid. And our car's done. If I can get Chrome Dome to work, are you done under there? How long are you gonna milk that for, Mary? Oh, I get it done. Hey guys, Royal Dave. Hey Royal. How's it going? I personally am super excited to see the look on their face. The dailies are just wonderful people, good hearted people. They've been waiting way too long. So I cannot wait to see the look on their face when they see this car for the first time. You're ready? Yeah. You're ready? I'm ready. Chrome Dome? I'm ready. Iceman? Ready. Uh -huh. Yeah, look at it. You got that same look I got. Give him the look. Give him, give him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just excited uh, to see the owner's reaction to the car. As, as they are, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's gonna be a good day. Butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the anticipation, you know? Uh, oh my God, I hear it. Hard to hear with the wind blowing. Oh, yeah. I heard it. I hear something <laughs> starting. That's unmistakable. Okay, now that's just torture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Holy <laughs> smoke. But when I saw that thing coming around the corner there, it was just, couldn't believe it. It was amazing, amazing. It looks really clean with those tinted windows. Oh my word, that looks so amazing. <laughs> wow. Can you wow. believe it? Isn't that beautiful? Wow. What's wrong? <laughs> oh my God, it's just gorgeous. It looks better in real life than it even does in pictures. Mark? <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Hey, hey. Absolutely stunning, isn't it? It exceeds my expectations, let's put it that way. Um, after the long wait that we just went through here in this car, it's, it's a gem. It's beautiful. Can't believe how it turned out. That is freaking beautiful. Finally. <laughs> well, Okay, Hop in. <laughs> I have a traction now. Wow, look at the dash. God, man, I am just blown away. Dang. But take a look at that. Oh! Kept all your MTs, kept the original, your powder coated intake manifold. Holly redid the carburetor for us. This is a correct wow. replica of the three core high capacity radiator for it without having to punch holes for the 26. <gasps> Beautiful. Original heater hoses, heater hose clamps, original hoses, replica, all the pieces along there. And then he did a phenomenal job putting a Mopar Performance electronic ignition, converting it over to work with the factory regulator that you see right there. You guys. Just as close to factory stuff as you could get, including the, the battery. This is your original fender tag. You'll notice that the first screw right is on. painted, and the second one is bright like it's supposed to be. Your rack and pinion uses this power steering setup. You notice this isn't Mopar. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Why don't you sit in it and fire it up? Oh, yeah. Really? Tell me what oh, you think. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm getting right in the, get I'm in getting in the car. There you go. <laughs> okay, Royal, will you open the door for me? Well, of course. <laughs> Thank you. There we a little go. bit. I pushed Good. it That's up. It. Oh, you pushed it <laughs> up. Yeah, hers went forward while getting, yours went backwards. Sneaky. <laughs> huh? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's going to come in handy now, isn't it? Now, this is the sinful my, part. But this is your detail. fault, not mine. Oh, no. I that's say, on you, that's buddy. A freaking I usually melt when I get close to stuff like that. Hiring Dave was the right answer, and it's proven in every car he's worked on, and it's certainly proved in Mark and Elena's car. Uh, the reaction was fantastic. Uh, it was, I was so proud to be a part of this project, uh, doing my first car here at Graveyard Cars, and, and to see the reaction was just, it was awesome, phenomenal. Go test drive it? Sure. Don't let me stop you. <laughs> Let's go. go. It's hit the road, babe. I love this car, the way it sets, the color of it. It's just a cool car. This is what we do at Graveyard Cars. It takes pride, it takes dedication to be able to make a car go from dead to not only alive, but beautiful. Unbelievable. This is beautiful. Yeah, the guys did an amazing job on this. Beautiful ride. Listen to that. It's just awesome. As 
As I see the Dailies driving their car for the first time in 20 years, I have to reflect on what an amazing week it's been and what an amazing journey we've had. We got our 1970 Dodge Charger 426 MXFK5 burn orange painted. And despite Murphy's Law and the failures, we got our 1970 Cuda 340 EV2 running beautiful. AMD with their installation center did a phenomenal job on our 71 Phantom Cuda and it looks amazing. And of course, the 1970 Cuda 383 back to life, beautiful and in the hands of the owner. With our 1970 Cuda completely finished in the trailer and heading home, we have one task left before we call it a day. With the paint cured out, it is now time to cut and buff our Hemi Charger. All fresh paint jobs, once they cure out, need to be wet sanded and buffed. Still, no matter how nice you lay them out, they still need a little bit of wet yes. sanding and buffing, whatever. So the point is, you're trying to take out the imperfections in the paints. And so it's a, a system of knocking down the paint originally with 600 on a stick. That takes all the orange peel out of it. Point, of course, is that you're trying to get the 600 grit scratches out, then the 1,000 grit scratches out. Then once you do that, you can move on to the wet sand. Then I went over it with 1,500, 2,000, and then 2,500. That way, when it comes time to buff, and it buffs out fairly quickly. And now it is time to update the progress board. With the 383 CUDA done, we're taking it down off of the board. Our 340 CUDA is running great, so we can check off the drivetrain. And with the deadline this summer, we need to add our Phantom CUDA to the board and get it moving through the shop. The next immediate task is to get the drivetrain installed in our 1970 Hemi Charger RT. We have so much to do this season, we got no time for fooling around. If you haven't noticed, things have changed at Graveyard Cars. We are getting more done now than ever before. Even though we've got our show, even though we've got our shop, even though we are the best in the world, we are at the root of it all, Mopar lovers. We're blue collar, in the trenches, hard working American folks with the motto, it's Mopar or it's no car. Give me one right in there on that inside of that. No, no, oh, uh, dear God. Why, why have you gone crazy? Next time on Graveyard Cars, the pace is quickening for the burnt orange Hemi Charger. She is enchanting. She is sexy. She is jealous. She is the essence of evil. She is Christine, a 1958 Plymouth Fury. No one that knew her is alive to issue a warning. But the moment she seduces you into the driver's seat, she will own you, body, mind, and soul. There's no place you can go that she will not find you, no speed you can run that she cannot match. And she can never be stopped, because you cannot kill what cannot possibly be alive. Christine, coming soon to Graveyard Cars.